Okay, hello everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Todd Dickinson. I head the commercial team here at BioNanoGenomics. Uh, today we are uh, thrilled to welcome Tina Graves uh, who, uh, from Washington University who will be presenting uh, her work in using genome maps to create accurate human genome assemblies. So throughout the course of, uh, this is our third webinar uh, in our webinar series. Um, if you haven't joined before, um, I want to let you know that you can ask questions by using your chat box. Uh, at any time throughout the presentation, just type in your questions. We'll be monitoring them here. And then at the end of Tina's talk, um, you'll have a chance uh, to, we'll, we'll read out a few of these questions for as many as we have time for and, and give uh, Tina a chance to answer the questions. So with that, what I'm going to do is give a very brief uh, five-minute overview of uh, the, the bio-nanotechnology for those of you that may be still on new to, to our, our uh, platform. The technology is called the IRIS uh, system. And the, uh, the core concept behind the IRIS system is the uh, idea that we can linearize very long fragments of DNA. And so you're seeing here a video of a, a, a molecule several hundred KB long. And what we can do is we can introduce it into our iris chips where the molecules are stretched into nanochannel arrays, uh, thousands of molecules at a time. And we can image these molecules directly. No amplification uh, of, of the sequences involved. And again, the idea here is that we're keeping the DNA intact. And by doing that, by looking at very long molecules, hundreds of KB long, uh, we can uh, preserve the architecture of the genome and therefore allow you to see uh, things that aren't um, readily seen with other technologies such as next-gen sequencing or, or others. And so the concept here is, by, is, is preserving the genome, keeping things intact, and being able to see large-scale rearrangements or use it as de novo, um, for de novo assembly scaffolding. So this is a list of kind of the key application areas today for the IRIS platform. Structural variation detection, uh, scaffolding your uh, sequencing data, um, validating reference genomes that you might be working on, uh, sizing gaps in the genomes that you might be working on. And because this is a single molecule technology and very long single molecule technology, we can also start getting at haplotyping information. So to date, uh, over 90 organisms have been mapped on the IRIS platform. They range from bacteria to human. These have been done both uh, internally here at BioNano as well as throughout um, the world at our, at our customer sites. Uh, today, Tina will be focusing primarily on her uh, human work. This is what the IRIS system looks like. Uh, it is uh, comprised, it's a complete platform offering. It's comprised of a system, uh, uh, the chips, consumables, the, the reagent kits, and the software. The instrument itself is called the IRIS. It is a three laser instrument, um, basically a, high, a sophisticated single molecule imaging system. Uh, run all onboard electronics run by the touchscreen there. The IRIS chip, uh, we're now on version two of our IRIS chip, and that's what was used to uh, collect the data for this, the webinar today. Uh, it consists of two flow cells and 26,000 nanochannels on that IRIS chip, and that's really where the core technology is, the nanochannel array technology. Uh, the technology, of course, comes with reagent kits to, to label your DNA, and the software uh, is called IrisView. This allows you to visualize uh, the genome maps that you create on the IRIS system, as well as import next-gen sequencing data uh, and convert it to our genome map type of data and, and um, uh, compare and contrast those, those ty types of data. So at the core of the technology is uh, the, a, a labeling process that we, we call nicking and uh, labeling and repairing. The, uh, the concept here is that we use nicking enzymes, which are modified restriction enzymes. They recognize, um, in our case, a seven base sequence. And instead of cleaving all the way through like a restriction enzyme, they simply nick a single strand. This, uh, what this does is it keeps our double-stranded DNA intact and allows a, an opening for a polymerase to come in, initiate strand displacement uh, and polymerization, and it incorporates fluorescent nucleotides uh, in its wake. So the end result is uh, this image on the right that you see here is um, uh, very long molecules stretched in nanochannels um, with green labels wherever that seven base sequence occurs throughout the molecules. Uh, you'll know, also notice that the molecules are stained blue. Uh, that's, that's a yo-yo one dye that we use so that we can visualize where the molecules are in the nanochannel array. 
So that's the nicking and labeling process. Uh, and the, the wonderful thing is that nicking is really only one way to label. We're, we're working on many, many other different ways to label uh, DNA. You can imagine any kind of DNA protein interaction that you can think of where leaving a, a, a label on your DNA, you can use this technology to read it out. So it's a very broad tool. But today we use nicking and labeling, and this is what was used um, in uh, the, the data that Tina will present. So the next step here is once you've labeled, you can introduce, uh, you pipette your sample, label sample into the iris chip, and you administer it into the uh, flow cell. And this is a video, hopefully the video is coming through the, the WebEx, where, you can, where we pull molecules um, by electrophoresis into the pillar region where they, they untangle and unwind, and then they're introduced into the nanochannels where they're fully elongated. You can see a, a scale bar up here in the upper right-hand corner, 75 kb. So you can see these molecules are very long. They range anywhere from 20 kb up to a megabase or longer. And that's really the, 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 crutch of the, the crutch of the technology here is really the long uh, molecules. So we can pull these molecules into the nanochannel array uh, one cycle at a time. We, we pull them in, we turn the current off, we take a picture, we flow them away to waste, and we bring in the next batch. And you can do this over and over again, uh, 20, 25 cycles. Uh, and this is really what's allowed um, BioNano to scale its technology to large genomes, to, to now human and, and beyond. Now once those images are taken, our software automatically identifies where the molecules are and extracts those molecules along with the labels, those NIC sites, um, and we represent them in digital form by these vertical black bars represent the NIC sites in the molecules. The next step is to feed those molecules into our de novo assembly algorithm. This is a pairwise comparison of every two molecules in the uh, collection, and bit by bit you grow a map together. Um, everything we do is de novo. We believe that uh, references in many cases are, are, are oftentimes wrong or not complete and, and the better answer is to build it from scratch and so uh, we, we use a de novo assembly approach here. Once you've created your genome map, uh, and we'll always represent throughout Tina's presentation and, and any presentation you hear from us, our genome maps uh, are blue and they're compared to um, a green uh, reference. Uh, they, can, the, they can be compared to uh, human reference, it could be compared to next-gen sequencing data, they could even be compared to another genome map. Uh, in this case, what I'm showing is a cartoon of, of a, a deletion event. You see the genome map in blue has uh, several labels missing uh, relative to the green reference, and so that would represent as a uh, 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 deletion event. And so the idea here is you can use these genome maps to see all kinds of structural variations, insertions, deletions, uh, balanced, imbalanced uh, events uh, in, uh, in doing your, uh, your biology. So that's really the, the, uh, the, how the, the technology works. Um, and I think with that, we're gonna move now over to introducing uh, Tina. Before I do that, I'll, I'll point you to our website. If you do have any more questions, there's lots of information, uh, bionanogenomics.com. And uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, of course. Okay, so that's uh, the introduction. Um, I am now delighted to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. It's uh, Tina Graves Lindsay. Tina joined uh, the, the Genome Institute at WashU in 1996 and is currently heading the Genome Reference Consortium uh, Group. Uh, this group is responsible for improving the human and mouse reference sequences by correcting any misrepresented regions and closing as many gaps as they can. The effort is also producing alternative assemblies of structural variant loci for the human genome. And in addition to this, uh, 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 her duties with the Genome Reference Group, uh, Tina also oversees the clone-based sequencing pipeline at the Genome Institute at WashU. So uh, with that, I think we've got Tina's slides up now. Everything's going well here, so I think I'm going to turn it over to Tina. Okay, thank you, Todd. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, using the genome maps to create uh, accurate human genome assemblies. Okay, it's not advancing.
Okay, sorry, it's not advancing my slides here, so let me see. Okay, now it seems to be doing There you go. Okay, looks like we lost Tina's audio. We're going to give her a second to call back in. Sorry, folks. Hang with us. Okay, I'm back. I don't know what happened there, but... Okay, great. Thanks, Tina. We're with you. <laughs> Sorry about that. No so problem. this is a outline, of course, and now I can't advance again. Okay. Okay, so here's a brief outline of my talk. I plan to tell you a little bit about our CHM1 project, um, give an overview of what we've done so far. I'm going to give you some examples of some regions that have been resolved in the current reference um, using this single haplotype source. And then I'm also um, going to tell you about the BioNano genome map and how we've used it to assess and validate our whole genome assembly. So um, in any whole genome assembly, or well, in any human whole genome assembly, uh, one of the major problems is distinguishing between allelic copies and repeat copies. When sequencing the diploid sample in segmentally duplicated regions, you can't determine if a given read is from an allelic copy or a repeat copy. Imagine how difficult this would be to sort out in a whole genome assembly, especially when created from short read data. However, in a haploid genome, there are no allelic differences. So all sequence difference are either differences are either errors or paralogs. And sequencing errors should be overcome with enough sequence coverage. So this is a simple example of um, where conflicting alleles caused problems in an assembly. In humans, the gene UGT2V17 is known to be a copy number variant. Some individuals have one copy of this gene and others have no copy. RP11 happens to be heterozygous for this endel. And RP11 is the sample that was used for the majority of the reference um, genome. So in this diagram, the colored boxes up here at the top represent the clone path that we had through um, Build 36. You'll notice that we have a gap here, and the yellow bars indicate annotated segmental duplications. Then also there were two different genes annotated on this build. So from work done by this group, it was, they discovered that in build 36, we're actually representing two different alleles, and that, that is causing part of our assembly problems here. So we decided to correct this in build um, 37. So we basically removed the black clones, and we were able to close the gap, creating the insertion allele. And using those black clones, we had to sequence one additional clone to complete the path, but then we're we were also able to make an alternate locus uh, representing the deletion allele. So you can see um, in this example, we previously had falsely annotated segmental duplication that did not belong there. And then the other um, thing that changes the biology of this region is that previously we thought there were two different genes here. And in reality, there's one gene and a variant copy of that gene. So you can see how this example shows the utility of having single, a single haplotype through some of these regions um, of the human genome. So in order to resolve some of these regions, it was decided that sequence from a haploid source, a hydatiform mole, would be extremely useful. Uh, this is formed when an enucleated egg is fertilized by sperm. The cells go through several rounds of cell division and the resulting DNA is a diploid copy of the exact same genetic material. The hydatiform mole source that we are using has been, has been designated as CHM1. 
So as part of the Genome Reference Consortium, our goals here at the Genome Institute are to fix regions of the reference like the example I just showed. The first resource from CHM1 that was highly utilized is, is the CORI-17 BAC library. This BAC library was fully in sequenced using capillary sequencers. Um, we also had a multi-enzyme fingerprint map, and along with that, since, since the beginning of using this, there have been over 600 clones that have been sequenced, with about 500 of them in GenBank currently as phase three, which is complete sequence. Um, so this back library has been used to sort out many diff uh, difficult to sequence regions in the reference. So here's one of those examples um, of the regions where we wanted to sequence with the CORI-17 back library. The SRGAP2 family, uh, gene family, maps the three specific regions on chromosome one. All three of these loci were poorly assembled in GRCH37. This region was resequenced re using the back library. The diagram shows the homologous regions using near repeats, where the green lines indicate nearly identical segments between um, SRGAP2A and its um, paralogs. Then the blue lines actually delineate the larger extent of homology between SIRGAP 2B and C. Um, notice the scale of the region. The, the total length of this is 600 kb. These red box regions are about 240 kb of nearly identical sequence. In GRCH37, these regions contain multiple haplotypes and were very fragmented. By sequencing these regions with the CORI-17 BACs, we were able to fully resolve all three regions. So here's another view of, of this a portion of the 1Q21 region. So this graphic at the bottom represents um, the clone path that we had through here, and it shows the alignment of the patch sequence to the reference. These blue, blo blue boxes indicate regions that were completely missing from the reference. So by sequencing this with the single haplotype source, approximately 500 kb of sequence that was previously misassembled, incorrectly oriented, or completely missing has now been resolved. So the ITH region is one that highlights allelic diversity. Because this region is so diverse, we wanted to have a single haplotype representation across the entire, uh, entire region. The reference assembly in this region was constructed from multiple libraries. Um, the, the top line of this diagram represents the CORI-17 sequence. The bottom represents the GRCH37. The um, green blocks are shared alleles between the two sequences. And the important thing to note here is that the orange blocks are actually insertions compared to GRCH37. And this one in particular is a gene that is represented in 80% of the population, but was not previously in the reference assembly. So not only does this source provide a single allele through the area, it's also adding variation that was not previously in the reference. So the more we worked with the sequences from this haploid, haploid source, we realized the utility of having it, so we wanted to uh, sequence the entire genome. We generated deep Illumina coverage and a reference guided assembly was created. This um, current assembly is known as CHM1 underscore 1.1. The assembly was done by Risha Arguala um, using her SR Prism software from NCBI. Um, the process is that there's an alignment of the Illumina reads to the GRCH37 primary assembly. One thing that's unique about this assembly compared to other whole genome assemblies is the fact that we used many back tile paths in segmentally duplicated or difficult to assemble regions. There were 45 total paths used in this assembly, with another 104 clones used as singletons. A final step was done to compare the assembly back to GRCH37 to provide appropriate gap sizes. 
This assembly um, is freely available in GenBank and can be downloaded by using um, the following accession number here. So here are a few stats from our assembly. Uh, actually, so the, the use of the BACs through the difficult to assemble regions allows for a more complete local assembly of the problem regions instead of, instead of assembling them in conjunction with the entire genome. The stats below show that the N50 uh, size of the contigs is relatively large when compared to other whole genome assemblies that are currently in GenBank. This is due in part to this incorporation of the back path. Um, this diagram shows an example of a back path through CHM1. And then this top portion represents CHM1, the bottom portion represents GRCH37. The blue lines through here represent the clone path. So in both assemblies, we have sequenced clones through um, most of this region. Then we also, the second track is an assembly-assembly alignment. So the, the two assemblies were compared to each other. The, the like-colored boxes represent the same portion of sequence. So this is, um, correlates to this sequence, the green correlates to this, and the purple box correlates to this. The one thing that you'll note is that the GRCH37 is completely contiguous, and we do believe that this assembly is correct, but there's also all this data in CHM1 that's present that was not present in GRCH37. We believe this to be a polymorphism between the two samples. Um, so we believe both assemblies to be correct. But by having these facts um, in our CHM1 assembly, it allowed us to get a better assembly using the short read data um, through this area. If we did not have the backs through here and just used the Illumina data, our assembly could have looked more like uh, the reference, would have, which would have been incorrect. So this is an example where the back integration was really helpful to sort out a region in our assembly. So next I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some different assembly methods that we have. Um, we obviously have the bio nano genome map and we've used, um, we've compared the genome map data to our assembly and then used the SV calls to, um, to assess different regions of, the, of our assembly. We also have a PAC bio CHM1 assembly um, and, and the PAC bio reads. So we've used both the assembly and the reads. Um, aligned to our Illumina-based assembly and looked for differences between the two. And then we've also, with the reads, we've looked for regions that were calling cliffs. And I actually have an example that I'll show you later in the presentation. So another assessment tool that we've used is the alignment of the Illumina data back to the CHM1 assembly. We've um, done this and run our variant caller pipeline on it to identify potential SNPs, which there should be no SNPs in the assembly. Um, using IGV, we can actually view um, particular regions of this alignment and look for um, places where there's potential collapse in the assembly. So here's kind of a list, um, and this is similar to what Todd presented, of ways that we can use the genome map to assess our assembly. We've used it um, for assembly confirmation. So in places where we've got difficult regions where we're unsure if our sequence assembly is correct or not, we can use it to confirm that. We've also used it to order and orient contigs of the assembly. We've used the SV calls to examine assembly inaccuracies, um, and we'll see in insertion deletions, and also inversions. And then we've also used it to get more accurate gap sizing on certain regions. So the genome map that we have for CHM1 has been constructed for us by Dr. Pooley Fox Lab. They generated over 50x coverage of data, data after filtering. So here's a few stats from the map assembly. When filtering using a minimum molecule cutoff length of 150 kb, we ended up with 57x coverage. 
um, but I believe they did the assembly uh, more stringently, more stringently, and used the 180 kV cutoff. So it ended up being 50x coverage. We had uh, 3,600 MAP molecules or MAP contigs, which 98% of them aligned to our sequence assembly. It gave us a genome coverage of 89%. So going back to this example of the 1Q21 region where we had resequenced the path with the CORI-17 clones, I wanted to look at this region aligned to the genome map to confirm that we had our assembly correct. So in this, in this view, you'll see um, in the 1Q21 region, the total length of the sequence was 7 megs. So um, to explain this view, basically these are the individual map molecules this green bar, as Todd indicated, is our sequence assembly, and then the blue bars are the genome map context. And one thing you'll notice is that the entire region is aligned very well, so this really confirms that our assembly of this very duplicated region is assembled correctly. So here's another example of a region that we've resequenced parts of this using the single haplotype back library. Basically, all of these repeat regions we've resequenced using the CORI-17 library. The williams buren region is, a, is on human chromosome 7, and it's associated with uh, developmental delay. It's a contiguous gene, continuous gene deletion sy syndrome. It's mediated by the segmental duplications that occur. So in the previous assembly, it was composed of many different libraries, thus confounding the assembly problem in the region. By retiling this with the CORI-17 backs, we were able to assure that the repeat copies are put together correctly. We closed the gap and represented a valid haplotype in this medically important region by resequencing it with the CORI-17 clones. So this is... Um, this is that same region aligned to the genome map. This shows the inversion of uh, sequence at this area. And it shows how, and you can also see how the, all of the sequence lines up very well. So this can, is another way to confirm that our assembly through this region is correct. So the beta defensin region is another very complex region of the assembly. This uh, view is the CHM1 map context aligned to GRCH37. And you'll notice that it is extremely messy. Um, this actually, the, the GRCH37 sequence through here we know to be incorrect. It's very fragmented and um, there are multiple large duplications that are not represented correctly. Um, and the maps actually show uh, the severity of the problems in the assembly through here. Um, so again, this region, we've resequenced portions of it uh, with the CORI-17 library. We still don't have it completely sequenced. But basically, the portions that we've worked on look to align to the maps much better now. You can see that there is a portion that disagrees, and we do have gaps through here. So this portion of our sequence assembly will likely pull apart and we'll need to add more sequence in through here to completely um, have the path closed. And once we do that, we'll realign again to our maps to see if we've got it right. We also have gaps down here, too. Um, but basically, it's in much better shape than it was in GRCH37, so bringing it to a single haplotype has really helped us to um, resolve this area. So um, this is an example of where we've used the PAC bio reads aligned to our Illumina assembly. So in this view, the green, green bars up here represent the whole genome context. The bluish purple bars down here are the PAC bio reads. And you'll notice that all of them have these sharp um, areas of where they stop aligning, 
and that's what we're calling cliffs in the pack bio reads. And you'll, if you notice, they're, they correlate with where the contig breaks are in some instances. So we believe that this is pointing out that our contigs through this region are not ordered and oriented correctly. So we looked at this region um, using the map data also. This region of the map that does not align to the sequence assembly correlates to those uh, contigs that are looked to be misordered. So this is another view of that same um, initial picture there. So the red line, the red dotted lines indicate the WGS contig boundaries where we believe there to be problems. The yellow, blue, and green boxes indicate the orientation and the alignment of the same read. So basically, in this blue box, this is a portion of one read oriented in this direction. This is another portion of that same read oriented in the opposite direction. So this indicates how the sequence likely needs to flip. Um, from looking at all this data, what we determined that these two contigs need to be flipped and then moved over to in between these two contexts. So we actually manually made those changes and then realigned it to our genome map data through here. And now you can see all the area in the middle that did not align before now does align. So this is another confirmation that our corrected assembly is, is right. So here's an example of um, a clone that we had in our assembly where we had gaps on either end of the assembly or either end of the clone. And basically we had no information to link this clone to the other whole genome contigs through here. So basically we didn't know what orientation this uh, clone should be. So when we compared it to the uh, genome map, you can see that in this instance it looks like the this clone here needs to be flipped. So we actually flipped the sequence, flipped the clone, created a new piece of sequence, and realigned it. And you can see now that um, once it was flipped, it actually aligns much better. It does look like we have a problem here, like a potential collapse in our assembly also, which I haven't looked at yet. But now we do have the correct orientation of that clone. So here's an example of an orientation, another orientation problem that actually happens within a clone. So this first problem that is discovered uh, between the map and the assembly is this discrepancy in size here. You'll notice that the BioNano genome map is smaller through this region than our assembly. When we went in and looked at the assembly, this is actually a gap in our assembly. So it's a, it's a discrepancy on the size of the gap. So we, we can easily correct that by changing the gap size. But when looking at this, we also noticed that it looks like there's a region here that doesn't align properly. We went in and looked at the clone that was sequenced through this region, and there's a 50 kb um, inverted repeat in that clone that we had to tag as unresolved because we were unable to tell exactly which, which way to orient the loop in the, between the large tandem or the large inverted repeat. Um, so when we went in and looked at the clone again, it, it correlated exactly to this spot. So we flipped the repeat, flipped the loop here in the clone and resubmitted it and it actually then lines up correctly. And this is actually a, a more simplified version of that same exact problem. It's actually a different clone, but the same problem. So in another instance when we had a large inverted repeat, um, the, the loop was unoriented. But by looking at the pattern here in the genome map, you can see that we really should have it inverted. So we're able to then go in, fix this in the clone assembly, and resubmit it to correct this piece of sequence. So here's an example where we use the um, SV calls that were uh, put out by the BioNano data. 
So um, these, these discrepancies are in relationship to the BioNano data. So this insertion here actually means that there's more data in the BioNano map than compared to our assembly. And in this case, the BioNano map shows a deletion when compared to um, our assembly. This actually, this region in our assembly was a gap. So again, it's a, it's a size issue. We've sized the gap incorrectly. In a lot of instances, we don't necessarily have any evidence of what size the gap is, so we pick a standard size to use, and that's what's happened here. Um, so we're able to easily correct that. This, um, this problem is a little bit more complicated in that it looks like we have a potential collapse in our assembly through here. So for this region, we wanted to actually look at the Illumina data to see what was going on. So we looked at the Illumina data that was aligned back to our assembly. The reads here, so this is an IGV view um, showing how the reads align to our consensus through this, this region. Um, and the fact that there's a base pair discrepancy here um, points out a potential collapse. So we actually passed this region off to our finishing group where they were able to look at this region in more detail and they actually found more reads further out that were aligned incorrectly. And they were able to manually pull apart the data and get the correct assembly manually through this region. So this is just an example of a clone where we knew we were missing data. The clone itself was supposed to be a certain size, and when we fully sequenced it, it was coming up almost 100 kb too, too small. So we knew ahead of time that we were missing data in here. We weren't sure exactly how much. But then when comparing this to um, the genome map data, it was at, it really was missing about 100 kb. So this confirmed our suspicion that the the region of sequence through here is missing about 100 kb. And you can see that there is some kind of tandem duplication um, going on with the sequence through here. So that's likely why our assembly or the clone itself deleted. So here's an example of where we can use the genome map to accurately size some of our gaps. In TRCH38, this chromosome 8 gap, we are calling it a stalled gap because basically we've done everything that we can up to this point to try and sequence through it and we're not successful. And you can look by the, the sequence alignment to the map config that there's a huge tandem uh, duplication in here. We had previously estimated the size at 150 kb and again that's just kind of a standard when we're not really sure what to size it at. But in reality, it looks like the genome map is showing that there's over 500 kb missing here. Um, and it's likely that we'll have a hard time getting through this, so it's likely that it'll remain a gap, at least with the current technologies we have now. So another way, um, or another thing I really wanted to look at was to see how well the BioNano genome map actually uh, extends through repetitive sequence. Um, such as the centromeres and telomeres. In this top picture, it, this is a chromosome 4 P arm where this is going towards the centromere off on this side. The green bars at the top here indicate the actual whole genome context in the assembly. So you can see that we have large gaps in the assembly going up to the centromere. And also that there's a lot of really small um, contigs and it's very fragmented in the assembly through here because of the repeat. So when looking at the sequence compared to the map through here, you can see that we have regions of collapse and also then regions that um, we do not have any sequence coverage for where the genome map does extend um, further than what we have. Uh, this second example here is the chromosome 20 telomere and basically from here on in our sequence is a gap because we, we can't um, get sequence to successfully extend any further. But you can see at the genome map that um, we have extended into the repetitive sequence. 
So future directions of our project. We plan to integrate the newer data set. Um, the PAC bioassembly is about 20,000 contexts right now, and it's not ordered or oriented. We would like to really use the BioNano genome map that we have to put that assembly into scaffolds so we have order and orientation for those. This will enable us to do a lot more with the PAC bioassembly that we, we are currently unable to do. So also, um, David Gordon has integrated the genome map output into BAMScape, which is um, what we use. It's part of CONSED, and it's used um, internally as our whole genome finishing tool. And this is just an initial view of it, um, but basically the BioNano information is uh, added as a track down here. So this will enable um, us to work within our editing tool and actually check kind of on the fly how, as we um, manually fix regions, like the region that I had spoke about earlier where we had the collapse. As the finisher is working on that region and they pull apart the region and they think they have it correct, they can actually uh, now check within CONSED to see if it matches the genome map data through that region as opposed to um, getting out of that data and actually doing it in the IRIS view software, which they can also do. Um, this is a, a beta version. We just got it a week or so ago, so we're just now beginning to test it, so we don't know um, how robust it is yet, but so far it looks good. So additional um, clone paths are also being worked on in regions where uh, the assembly is very fragmented or where we know that there's large segmental duplications. Many of these paths have already been used in the reference, but we will continue to add these to the GRC releases um, wherever they are useful. Our ultimate goal for this project, though, is to have a single allelic representation of the entire CHM1 genome. This assembly can then be used as a reference if you wanted a single haplotype across the entire genome or even just for specific regions if you want the single allelic representation. It can be used for that. Okay, and with that, I wanted to acknowledge the many different people that have helped on this project. There are a lot of people here at the Genome Institute who have worked on this. Um, the majority of the clone sequencing and the Illumina data that was generated um, by us at the Genome Institute. Uh, the assembly and um, some of the analysis that we've done comparing assemblies were done by Risha and Valerie at NCBI, and then previously Deanna has also done a lot of work um, with us on this. Um, the segmental duplication work that we've done has been in collaboration with Evan Eichler and some of the people in his lab. Urvashi Sertai is the one who actually created the cell line, so that's enabled us to do um, all of this work. Peter DeYoung created the Cori 17 back library, so that's been an extremely useful tool. And then also, as I mentioned, um, Dr. Pui Kwok is the one whose lab generated the data for us, because we do not have a machine yet. Um, and then also I want to thank all the people at BioNano Genomics who've helped with getting us up to speed and working with this data and um, enabling us to use the data to help our assembly. So with that, I'll take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, we now open up the floor for questions. Type into your chat box, please, if you, uh, if you have a question for Tina. Okay, Tina, uh, our first question is, what is the largest SV you, you were able to see using the BioNano technology? Oh. Um, I don't really have a good answer for that one. Uh, I know that we've seen, I mean, we've, we've actually seen large insertions, over hundreds of KB um, in the different, uh, or in the regions that we've sized gaps incorrectly. So we have seen large regions that way. I don't know that we've seen, um, I'm not sure if we've seen other bigger regions 
of sequence difference. Yep, okay. That, that's consistent with what we're seeing here, too. We, we've seen the, the ability to see SVs anywhere from 1 KB all the way up to several hundred KB. Any other questions? Feel free to type in. Okay, Tina, the next question is, what pipeline did you use for the assembly? So um, the assembly, our assembly, the Illumina data was used, um, was actually assembled by Risha Argwallet and CBI. And I don't know that it, it's, SR, it's part of her SR PRISM software package, but I don't know if that's an easy piece of software to use for this kind of, you know, I don't know if you can just download that software and do this assembly. She actually did it for us. Okay. All right, we've got another question. How many enzymes are there to choose from and what NICs in the centromere? I guess that's a question for you because I'm not really sure. Sure, I, I'll, I'm happy to answer that. So currently we have uh, two commercially available nicking enzymes that we use most often. We've also validated another two. So there's about four that we've used most often. And uh, be, among the organisms we've tried, those four have been able to do every single organism that we've, we've uh, attempted. And in terms of nicking and centromeres, of course, that will depend on, on the repeat patterns and the repeat size and whether or not there's, there's a nick in the centromere uh, of that particular organism. We have explored a couple different nicking enzymes that uh, are, uh, are seen in several centromeres, but uh, that's uh, definitely an area of further development. Okay, another, another question, Tina, for you is, can you explain again how did you resolve the cliffs Okay, um, let me go back to that. So, so when looking at this alignment, this is actually a pack bio read that aligns to our components within the assembly. And by looking at the, the we have, um, you can't see it here, but you, there's actually an orientation. And then also we know what read this is you can then match it up with the other portion of the read. And by looking at how the pattern was, like for example, the front part of this yellow read goes to another portion of this. So you know that these two, this is the exact same read, just different portions of that read aligned. So you can actually use this to determine that this sequence component needs to go next to this sequence component and they're oriented in the same direction. When you look at this one, this piece actually is in the opposite orientation of this. And these are, again, portions aligned of the same read. So then this is how we figured out that you need to flip these two contigs here and that they need to move over here because this component here and this component should be next to each other based on the alignment. So hopefully that answers the question. Great, thanks Tina. Are there any other questions? We'll give one more minute here for any other uh, remaining questions to be typed in. Okay, Tina, we have another question coming in. Uh, how do you explain the unaligned part of a bio-nano contig? Um, well, there's, uh, there's likely many different possibilities. So an unaligned portion of a contig could very easily be that our assembly is incorrect. Um, it could be that we're missing data in that region. And, and there's always the possibility that 
the assembly of the map content could be incorrect too. Um, if there's, um, if you go, I'll go back to my very beginning here. If you actually go in and look at the molecule data, that that should give you more information on what maybe is going on in the region, whether it points to a sequence assembly issue or potentially an issue in the genome map contig. You know, if you had a region where there was very little coverage of the individual map molecules, it could point to a potential issue in the the genome map. But in most instances so far, what we've seen is that it, the genome map contigs are pointing to problems in our assembly. So hopefully that explained it. Great, Tina. Thanks. I think we've got one more coming in here. I think they're typing. Okay, and this question, Tina, is what kind of QC can be done to confirm errors in the BioNano genome map itself? Um, I, you can probably speak to this too, but I think the biggest thing is to look at the individual map molecules. And I, I don't have a very good zoomed in view here, but essentially you could see where the NIC sites are and how they align to each other. And if there's a region where um, there are discrepancies in how the data aligns, um, you know, how the molecules align to each other. That would be a potential a region that maybe needs to break in the the map context. I don't know, Todd, if you want to add more to that. No, I, I think you did a good job, Tina. We do have in our software um, quality scores and associated with individual molecules based on the signal to noise of each label, and so we know the quality of, of the individual reads or molecules, uh, as well as how well they map to each other and in, into the consensus map. Um, so we do have some kind of basic bioinformatic QC methods um, for assessing the quality of, of our maps. And uh, this is Pollock at BioNano. I'm a bioinformatics support scientist here. Uh, one of the most important metrics that we also use is uh, confidence scoring. Uh, we use a p-value in order to associate all of our alignments. So depending on your thresholding for your confidence levels of your alignment, uh, you can uh, filter out or perform QC on that respect. Great. Um, we have another question here, um, and that is actually for uh, BioNano. Can both nicking enzymes be used together in order to get a more dense map? And the answer to this is yes. Um, in some cases where uh, in certain organisms um, where the nicking frequency is much lower for any particular, one particular enzyme, we actually bundle two nicking enzymes together to get more um, frequent nicking. What's, what really determines the optimal nicking frequency is a combination of our resolution, optical resolution, and that is currently about 1 kb. Uh, as well, uh, and that's at the low end. And at the high end, um, if it's too sparse, of course, you don't have enough information. And so um, the ideal range is really anywhere between 5 and 15 kb you want to nick, right around 9 or 10. And if uh, the organism of interest doesn't nick that often um, with one enzyme, then yes, we can add two enzymes. Uh, the instrument also is fully capable of two color, uh, add, actually doing two different nicking enzymes at the same time. Um, and we're just finishing our software, and by, by end of this year, we plan to launch a uh, full two-color capability um, as well. Okay, any last-minute uh, questions here before we wrap up? I think we've got one more coming in here. Um, okay, have you seen any heterozygosity structural variants on the same locus, which may, be rep may represent as multi-aligned by more contigs? Um. Well, I mean, I showed the example of the beta defense in region and how there were multiple maps aligned to the same region. Um, so since our, we haven't seen a lot of that in 
our CHM1 assembly because for the most part in really large duplications, we've already tried to sort them out using the single uh, allele back library. So I think we've resolved a lot of the large duplications that could be potentially collapsed. But um, I mean, an example of that is the beta defense in region and how we aligned those data to GRC H37 to show how it was, you know, so severely collapsed. So I'm not sure if that completely answers the question. Yeah, that's good, Tina. And I will add to that that, um, you know, in, in diploid human and other organisms that we measure here, uh, we, we readily can detect heterozygous events. Typically half the molecules will give uh, one pattern and half the molecules will give another. Um, and our software in many cases can pick that up automatically. In some cases we can dive into the single molecules and, and detect that um, uh, manually. Uh, okay, we have another question here. Um, this is, I think, for, for you, Tina. Can you tell us a little about the map assembly algorithm? Um, I don't know much maybe that, about Maybe that's the, better answered by us. <laughs> yeah, so, like, uh, I don't think I know that. Sure. So uh, the basic concept we use in our assembly algorithm is the uh, OLC method, uh, the algorithm, the overlap layout consensus method. So we'll take uh, individual molecules, perform pairwise alignment among the molecules, and then use the OLC algorithm to build out and extend uh, the contigs. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, involved than that, but as a, at a high level, that's the basic way the algorithm works. Great. Thanks, Pollock. Okay. I think we're out of questions, and we're pretty much up against our time. So. Um, yeah, we have one last question here. Any plans to make these slides available? That's a perfect segue into uh, wrapping up. So we do record these webinars, and um, we will make them available on our website within uh, the next couple of days. You can go and you can listen to this. You can see the slides. Um, and uh, always, if you if you actually want a copy of slide decks, feel free to email info at BioNanoGenomics. So that will come to us, and we will we will respond um, to that. And with that, I will bring this webinar to a close. Tina, thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, to our audience, thank you for the great questions. And I do want to advertise our next one, which will be in a couple of months, uh, August 27th. Um, Dr. Ali Bashir and Bobby Sebra from Mount Sinai will be presenting on their work uh, with uh, BioNanoData. Um, and that will be uh, August 27th, Wednesday at 9 a.m. Again, it will be posted on our website. I hope you guys can all join us for that. Thanks very much, and uh, we'll end here.